now uh, we go to the real meeting, the real reason for this meeting, for all these uh, more than 40 people attended today, not for my uh, awkward introduction. So uh, it's for the special occasion of having Steve Adams and Colin McPhee. Uh, they uh, taught a couple of courses here in Perth. So uh, they are also available now. They made themselves available to us to do a presentation for us. So uh, I think you already know them. You, I don't need a lot of introduction. They published books, which are reference books in saturation height function and in uh, core analysis. Uh, but I will let them talk more about themselves. I hope that they will not be shy and about the expertise and the subject is the impact of up upscaling on porosity, permeability, and water saturation modeling in heterogeneous reservoirs. So I think, Steve, you are the first one? Yes, that's me. So, Colin, I'll give you a mic probably so that yeah. you don't need to do a switch. Yeah, so Colin, give the act. Um, I get a next the next slide, so we need to go to the... Exit and somewhere. There must be that one. All right, let's go there. So let's start with the beginning. Topic of the sub that we're going to talk about is um, we're going to talk about heterogeneous reservoirs. And the reason we're going to talk about these is because generally we don't do a great job of describing these things in our in our in our. Um, work. We try, but it's really, really hard to get all the information. And we're going to run through uh, some problems you have with trying to, trying to quantify what's going on in these reservoirs, both in the core acquisition side and also about how do we interpret that information. And there's some interesting things I want to show you and I want to get you to think about. Um, Colin and I have been doing a lot of discussion about this over. We've, we've been working mutually on, on a project together over the last few years, on, on a, and we'll talk about that case study a bit although we won't identify where it is. Um, we've got a very nice data set that's going to help us to show you some, some issues. And I'm going to guarantee that what we show you are problems that you are encountering, and you probably haven't noticed many of them, all of them. You'll know some of them, but you won't have seen them all. So for those who don't me, know me, I'm a consultant, Steve Adams. I've been around for, a, then, well, 31 years in the upstream oil and gas business. Um, I wrote the Shell Capillary Pressure Manual back in 1993 with another gentleman who was working at Shell. Since then, I put a new book out, available from my website. Do you go and check that? So check that one out on saturation height modeling for reservoir description. Um, so that's a bit of an aside. But we've got a... Turns out, over the years, I've been a, made a point of, of doing... I don't want to do the ordinary stuff. I want to do the difficult job. So I get presented with all these kind of problems to solve, which has been great. Um, our business is great in that respect. So it's given me a little, a little insight into these things, and I've developed a sort of a problem-solving bent, which works pretty well with Colin, actually, and he'll tell you about himself, and then we'll get back into the talk. Yeah, um, hello, I'm Colin McPhee. It's been some time since I've been in Perth. Um, I'm basically a semi-retired uh, consultant specializing in uh, core analysis, geomechanics, and petrophysics probably over the last 40 years, and I'm the co-author of this book, available on Amazon.com. <laughs> I made the mistake, unlike Steve, of not self-publishing. So believe me, you don't make a lot of money from these books. I'm not going to retire on the proceeds. So that's me. I'm going to be talking about the core analysis side of this particular example. So I'll hand back to Steve. Yeah. Colin's right. You don't actually don't make a lot of money even you self-publish either, by the way. It takes a lot, of, it's a lot of time and effort to make, write a book. You don't do it for the money. You do it because you think you want to pass on the information. So, so Colin's been really, really good to donate his, his knowledge to the industry for, for not very much money. <laughs> Buy on Amazon.com. So what are we going to talk about? Upscaling. It's a word that we encounter a lot in our business, so we're going to talk about it here in a little more detail, and probably a lot more detail than you're used to seeing, and we're going to talk about why it matters. And then we're going to talk about Problems with the core sampling and how that might impact on what we do with our data and what assumptions we are making. And then we're going to do some simulation exercises, just looking at homogeneous reservoirs and upscaling in there. And then we're going to do some upscaling in a simple binary, binary, you know, poor reservoir, good reservoir system to show what happens when you do it there in a model. And then we're going to look at a case study and see what happens. So we're going to look at some very high resolution data, one centimeter type scale porosities and permeabilities, and then we're going to do, look at what that looks like on the logs, look at some core plug scale data, and some, then there's some wireline log scale data. And we're just going to see the differences between these data sets as we upscale between each different set. And it's quite interesting how things change. 
And there, there are some assumptions we're making, and we'll discuss these as we go. And at the end, we're going to do some talking about comparison against well tests, see how the performance is uh, in this particular case study. And I guess the point I'm trying to get to you across is that you know permeability will change when we upscale. That's because the, the relationship from processing and permeability will change. And that's fairly well understood, although, not, although not, we don't always do anything about it. And I'm going to show you that we should. Um, but we don't recognize is there's actually an impact on saturation height modeling as well, unless there's a, no, if, if there's a permeability, permeability relationship between with water saturation, and there usually is. So we'll talk about, at the end, we'll talk about some possible ways to deal with this and whether you should do anything about it. And the answer, of course, is you should do something about it. And we'll take it up from there. So upscaling, what is it? It's when we put, basically, we take measurements at one vertical scale. And what we're trying to do is we take them on a core plug scale, which is about four centimeters roundabout, as we're looking at horizontal plugs. And then we've got a log scales, 15 centimeters. Then we've got our static model scales, usually about a meter. Uh, you might be lucky if you're working at a Ramco. Well, one could debate whether that was lucky or not, and that they don't upscale at all. They, upscale, they, they work their, their models nowadays on, on a log, log increment, so 15 centimeters, and that's both the static and dynamic model. So some of these issues disappear if you have enough computing power. But we, most of us don't, so we have to deal with this. So what actually happens when you upscale, you want to be able to preserve the performance behavior. So you want to actually make sure that when you go from a core plug scale to a log scale to your static model scale, that the reservoir has the same volume and performance characteristics across the appropriate scales. Um, it's not as straightforward as you might think. So, why are we concerned? Well, first of all, we acquire core plugs at one scale, which I said about four centimeters, and we use those to construct relationships. That's our porosity versus permeability and a saturation height function. Um, and then we apply those relationships at a wireline log scale, so that's a 15 centimeter scale. So, are we making a mistake there? That's the first question. Then we log scale. The log scale data is averaged up to your static model, and which will be the one to two meter scale, depending on the dynamic or static model. Um, what we would like is the reservoir performance and the reservoir description at each of those scales should match the actual performance of the reservoir if we actually produced it at that scale. That's what we really want. So what's the problem? Well, it turns out in a homogeneous reservoir, there's no problem. So for a homogeneous reservoir, we've got no problem at all. In heterogeneous reservoirs, we do have a problem because porosity, which is volume, volume type measurement, upscales just fine. But permeability is not a volume measurement. Permeability is a directional measurement. And it turns out that doesn't upscale just fine. And we'll show what, they, what I mean in a minute. And water saturations, because they're usually related to permeability, don't upscale properly either. And that's something we haven't, I haven't really addressed previously, although it has been addressed before in the literature, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But what we also have is problems with the sampling. So how do we make sure we have samples that we can actually use? And that's what I want to leave Colin to talk with in a minute, but we'll get to that second. second. So what we're going to do, we're going to start off with discussing the problems with the core. And on which in the core, the reason this, is, reason this is important because it is, core is what we base our primary relationships on. We base our porosities and our permeabilities and our water saturation, well, saturation height models on. Um, and then we're going to say, we'll do that. And then we'll talk, so Colin's going to talk about the core problems. Then we'll talk about some simulations, which I'll show you some simulation results. And then we'll show what happens in the binary system. And then we're going to illustrate what happens in a real, real core case. And I've got some really interesting core and core plugs to look at, as you'll see. So Colin's going to talk about routine core analysis problems. And uh, unfortunately, it's not as nice as we'd like it to be. Yeah, this is an um, example, is a real example of some of the challenges you face, not only in upscaling, but in actually getting measurements this is a, a fairly heterolithic sandstone reservoir. Um, I'm going to talk about the problems we had actually going to get plugs that you could measure things on. I'll talk about how we had to change the system. And then I'll talk about how some inaccuracies in the measurement can feed into the, uh, the, the problems we had. And you'll see that with what um, Steve is talking about in some of the upscaling. Okay, um, this is just one well of 400 plugs, one and a half inch diameter plugs taken at roughly one per 30 centimetres, 25 centimetres, plugged with kerosene. Um, the clay content in this reservoir is variable. Um, initial XRD suggests it's between 10% to 16%. Um, we wanted to condition the core for total porosity measurements. So in that case, we would try to do hot socks like cleaning and conventional oven drying at 106 degrees Celsius. 
um, to make sure that if there's any claybound water, this could be removed so that we could be measuring total porosity. Um, when we started cleaning the plugs, um, we've got a very high failure rate. Uh, but in, particularly in the heterolithic intervals where we had sand shale lamina, sand shale um, uh, clasts. And what we realized probably was that hot toluene takes the water out of the clay. And we think this boundary between the sand and shale was dewatered by the hot toluene cleaning. And that promoted failure along the bedding planes of the, of the core plugs. So we looked at lower temperature cleaning. And for those of you who know this, you could go to cool Soxlet, but this, that, that would take years in this case. Um, we looked at flush cleaning, but it's $650 a plug. Found it was a little bit expensive when you get 400 plugs. So we used this total immersion Soxlet apparatus. The advantages of this is that it's lower temperature. That was a principal advantage rather than retention of any claybound water um, and reducing interfacial tension. The whole thing about this was it was lower temperature. So the aims of the subsequent measurements were to try and minimize the risk of plug failure and capture as much poroperm data before the plugs fractured. So it was a bit of a weird routine core analysis program, basically involving three cycles. And part of this was driven by the fact that, is that permeability is only possible on an intact plug. You've got to have a cylindrical plug. On fractured plugs, on misshapen plugs, you can measure porosity and grain density. So what we're looking at is determining ambient condition porosity and clinkerbar permeability in this particular well at reservoir neck confining stress. So the first cycle was basically we cleaned it in toluene and humidity oven dried the samples. We measured porosity, permeability and grain density on every sample. This meant that there's a risk of salt or residual oil in some of the plugs, so we'd expect perhaps the porosity to be reduced, grain density to be reduced, and the permeability to be reduced. So after this, we then cleaned it again um, in the hot stock, in the, uh, the, the total immersion socks with methanol, and then humidity oven dried it at standard conditions. This runs the risk that in a, in a shale of sand, any claybound water might still be retained and the, the porosity is somewhere between total and effective. And then in the third cycle, we basically did conventional oven drying at 100 degrees Celsius, and that should remove any claybound water. Um, this technique, and in retrospect, we maybe could have looked at other, t other um, ways of protecting the plugs as well, but generally the far fewer plug failures, and this was then uh, transported to the other three cord wells. And what we found is if you look at the... Um, this is the, um, the change in um, porosity, and this is a change in permeability between, um, uh, between uh, after toluene cleaning, um, basically we found that there was little significant increase in the porosity and permeability. In other words, toluene on its own probably was quite effective at cleaning. What we're probably more interested in is the, the change in porosity and the change in permeability after conventional oven drying, after cleaning and humidity oven drying. So cycle three to cycle two. So that's the difference in porosity. That's the difference in permeability. And what we clearly see here is in the, the, the kind of lower permeability samples and the red are fractured samples, and we ignored those. Um, but when you look at the intact samples, which are shown as the large dots, what you see is, as you would expect, a small increase in porosity. Um, in those samples, but generally, where you get above about 16, 17% porosity, there's hardly any significant change. What you're seeing there is just random error, and that's within the acceptable error range for porosity measurements. So we couldn't see much there. Same with permeability, apart from in the 0.1 millidarcy and below. This is nothing to do, it actually masked any effects of, of um, in, um, in enhanced drying and this is, was due to basically inaccuracies in the measurement. There was probably around about 60% error in, in plug samples with uh, permeability less than 0.1 of a millidarcy. So in terms of measurements, we just applied a cutoff and basically handed over the data in terms of a quality flag. So it's green, amber, and red. Uh, amber is basically... Um, porosity data and samples um, which may have fractured. Green 
was the best data set. That's the one that we've got an intact plug and porosity, permeability, and grain density have been measured and have been quality controlled. Okay. Now, before I show you what the data that Colin's, Colin's talking about, how it all came together, what it looked like, I'm going to show you some simulation exercises we ran. And the reason I'm going to do that is because the simulation exercise will run on homo homogeneous reservoir just to illustrate that the methodology we work, we're using does make some sense in, the, in a homogeneous reservoir. Then we'll run it on a simple heterogeneous reservoir. And then I'll show you how the core looks and what the core plugs look like for this particular case. And the reason I want to do it this way is because you can, you can get an understanding of how you might expect things to vary. And then you'll see how it actually works and see how things go. So oh, this is not, it comes out much better on the screen over there than it does on here. Now, I've just got to turn this around so we can see. So what we have here is a straight up homogeneous reservoir, 50 millidiasi rock, 20% porosity. And I've, what you need to do is look at these curves on the right-hand side and see what they are. So this track is a porosity track showing 1,000 to 1,100 meters sub C, and it's just homogeneous. This is just a model. Permeability is on this track and see around 50 millidiasi. And on the right-hand side is a water saturation track. Now, what you need to know here is that water saturation is generated using a J function, so saturation height function. So it's using porosity, permeability, and a, a J function. So we've got a transition zone at the bottom. You'll see two lines on these curves. You see a blue one and an orange one. The blue line is always the one centimeter resolution curve. So I'm going to show you a series of displays. So the blue line is always one centimeter. Uh, and the orange one is the upscaled version. So in this case, it's upscaled to five meters. And you can see that there's absolutely no difference between the porosity and permeability upscaled. No surprise. It's a homogeneous reservoir. There shouldn't be. You do see a small difference at the bottom of this. Here. Hang on, turn that off. Small difference in the water saturation to the bottom, and that's just down to averaging over a transition zone, and the layer thickness is just too thick. So what I'm going to tell you now, and you have to take my word for it on this one, is this is a five-meter sample uh, averaging, and uh, the four-centimeter, the 15-centimeter, one-meter, and two-meter they look almost exactly the same, only just at the bottom end you'll see they fit better to this curve at the bottom. So that's a homogeneous reservoir. Let's look at this heterogeneous reservoir. So this is what the reservoir looks like. We've got five meter beds, and it's 0 0.02 millidarsies on the, on, the, on, the, on the millidarsie here, and on the other side it's 200 millidarsies. And we've got a linear porous, porosity relationship. So if I was to draw a poro perm line, it would join those two dots. So that's the poro perm relationship on the bottom right. You're just looking at two permeabilities. So it's either 0 0.02 millidarsies or 200 millidarsies. That's the first point you need to get across. So that's at one centimeter. So let's see what happens when we take these and we go up to a log scale. So log scale data is 15 centimeters odd. And you can see straight away, even with five millimeter centimeter beds, the model changes. So our poro perm model has changed from the straight line down here to this orange line. And that's because we're upscaling the permeability in a linear, linear fashion and displaying it on a log plot, which is fine. It's behaving as you would expect to do if you investigate it. So that's, that's what we expect to see. What I'd also like you to note, um, and if I actually do the numbers and calculate, even though you can't see much difference between the orange and the blue on these curves, there is a 3% difference in net times porosity times hydrocarbon saturation already. So the net's decreasing, the EHC is decreasing by 3%, just going from the core, so one centimeter to a log scale. So it's already decreased there. Just bear that one in mind. We go to one meter scale on a static model. So you can see over here, these points are still on the same line, but their location on that line is changing as we go. And you can see more differences on the, the uh, orange and the blue over in the permeability and also on the hydrocarbon saturation track. What's... Um, Interesting here is we're seeing this impact even on their thick five meter beds. There's a still a change. It's just the way that it's all about how, um, how we do our boundaries these days. So when I first started in the oil industry, we first didn't use computer. We used to draw maps by hand, of course. And then we go, the first static models we used to build, the boundaries always used to be at the formation boundary. So if there was a change in reservoir properties, we would put the formation boundary at that location in our, in our static model. These days, we just do it on a depth basis. You know, every one meter or half a meter is our vertical thickness. 
thinking we're covering the geological boundary. So maybe there are sometimes we don't always improve things. Changes should really happen at the geological boundaries if you can do that. Anyway, so I digress a little bit. So something's changing there. Poroperm going up to two meters, and we're again seeing the poroperm model changing. So we're seeing this over here. So that's pretty much as we expect. Uh, what you do now is notice if I go at the water hydrocarbon saturation, so you look at the, the orange curves now, that's the upscaled version of the data. And you can see, yeah, we're starting to get some issues in our water saturation and our permeability models. Um, in this particular case, it gets an increase in net times porosity times hydrocarbon saturation of 3% over the log scale data, which in turn was already, oh, sorry, go, it was uh, one log scale, where was it, log scale there. It's 3% down from the core data, so that's, no, that's okay. We can go to one, go to one meter, that's okay. Um, two meters okay, but when I go to a five meter scale, so this is why you don't use thick beds, by the way. So the poor repair model has now got either everything up at the high stuff and, sorry, everything down at this low, low perms, but that has a significant impact on your EHC, so it's an increase of 27% over your log scale data. So the saturation height model is now wrong and unacceptably wrong by upscaling, if you don't adjust your perms. So let's have a look and say, what, is, what happens in a real case? So I'm going to show you some very high-resolution data from a core. And we're going to look at core plugs. We're going to show you some logs. And then I'm going to show you some upscaled static models. And the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to show you the raw data first. And then I'm going to show you what happens when you actually physically upscale the data. So here's the raw data. On the right-hand side, you can see a lovely piece of core from 2619 through to 2626, and I couldn't put all the core on here, otherwise you, you wouldn't be able to see it. But you can clearly see this is not a thin-bedded system, it's a heterolithic. We haven't got, we've got a lot of different things going on in here. So you can see where the core plugs are, um, shown on the core, and we've got a missing section through here. It's preserved, sorry. So we've got a whole lot of stuff going. This is obviously the best reservoir element, but you can see oil staining in these elements through here, through here, and Essentially, there's nowhere here you could put a core plug and guarantee that it was going to be perfectly homogeneous. On the left-hand side, you'll see a couple of logs. One says phi high and, and k high, and they're high-resolution porosities and permeabilities. Um, how, they, how I calculated them was, is, a, is a paper in itself, but essentially it's based on a UV trace through the core and a, and a transform derived from the homogeneous core plugs that we did get. So that's just a quick summary, but we have a high-resolution version of the porosity and permeability over here. Um, we're going to use those in a minute. And this, they don't look, I mean, this, this, for instance, if we look at this unit here, it doesn't look as though it's changing a lot. That's only a scale issue. If I was to zoom in on that, you'd see a lot more changes taking place. That's just a, a display issue. Okay, so what do the core plugs look like? So we're going from, so let's just get this straight. We're at a high resolution here, one centimeter. The next slide is a core plug scale. So what I've got on the right-hand side, I've got my high-resolution porosity and permeability. And at the core plug scale, I've got the red points, the core plugs, porosities and permeability. And there's a blue line is the mini permeameter. And a mini permeameter is effectively a core plug scale type measurement, rather than a, except there's a whole lot of core plugs next to each other. It's not, not the same as a really high-resolution measurement. measurement. Colin might uh, argue a little bit, but not too much. What you need to do is also look at the core plugs. And the core plugs look much clearer on the screen than they do on this screen, by the way, so you can actually start to see a bit of texture. See, these are supposedly homogeneous core plugs. They're clearly not. We've got these features in here. You've got cracks running through here. You've got another crack running through here. So you can see why there were problems measuring the reliable porosities and permeabilities. It uh, shouldn't really be a surprise. So other things that might be at a core plug scale would be things like an FMI or an ultrasonic uh, measurement of and maybe the dip meter resistivity you could use to give you a core, core plug scale type measurement. And here's some more core plugs just to show you that um, you know, even these, this one here is probably the most homogeneous plug that we, we've got a photograph of. And even here, if you look carefully, you'll see we've got some cemented streaks in through here. So we do the best you can, and that's the business, our nature of our business. We do the best we can, but sometimes uh, we have to put up with these kind of, these kind of problems. Okay. Now we're at log scale data. So what I've got here is, again, over this porosity track, you'll see the high-resolution high porosity, a permeability, many permeameters on there. Now I've got a log porosity, and you've got the wireline log curves on the right. So there's a log porosity on there, and there's a log derived using the core scale poroperm model. That's the light blue over the radon, all of it. 
Um, so they've already, already you're seeing over here, you're seeing that the high resolution data is, well, you go down to the mini permeator, it's being sucked down a bit. And then we see well, again when we look at the log scale data, it's no longer representing the peaks. That means if we use this description, we're not going to describe the dynamic performance properly. Okay, you might get the volume performance okay, volume okay because the porosity average is probably all right, but you will not get the dynamic behavior of the, of the reservoir correct. And if I upscale that again to a one-meter vertical scale like a static model, that's the magenta lines you'll see on here. So you can see again, shale fraction, porosity, but we're, so we're starting to lose, really are losing porosity uh, resolution, and certainly our permeabilities are definitely being well and truly impacted by that upscaling activity. And you can see, of course, this is where I was referring to before on the hydrocarbon saturation track. You'll see, because we haven't got the bed boundaries at the same location as the geological boundaries, we have got some mismatching issues. That's standard these days, unfortunately. So I'm not going to go to the static model scale because it doesn't serve any more purpose to illustrate than we've seen already. So there's a few points you can get out of this straight away. And that's, a, first of all, that your porosity... The way we work in our business is we take our porosity permeability transforms, derive the core plug scale, and we apply them at the resolution of the logs. And we assume that's a, a, real, a right thing, the correct thing to do. And we'll see in a minute whether it is or not. Uh, it, when log derived... And we, oh, update your virus protection. <laughs> Hit the cross. Okay. Oh, sorry. I'll get it. Timing's everything, isn't it? <laughs> when, okay, the other thing is that when, you, when we log, do our log derived porosity and permeability are upscaled to the poorer resolution of, of, of the static model, that averaging will change the relationship between porosity and permeability. So we need to be, be sure that we don't use a log scale poorer permeability model at a static model scale. Okay, so if we're going to put porosity and permeability in a static model, we have to take the log scale perm and upscale those with the porosity. Okay. Um, so, yeah, that's basically down, down to the, the, uh, the difference between volumetric upscaling and directional, which you use for the, for the perms. A um, whole lot of stuff on there on that. But at the end, in the end, we actually have to verify uh, upscale permittees against well tests to see whether they're actually reasonable or not. That's the best way to confirm the success of any upscaling. So I'm going to go back now to the high-resolution data. So I showed you those high-resolution re high porosities and permittees before. That's these tracks. So these are exactly the same displays I showed before, back here. Same type of display, only I'm putting real data in there. So this is real data, and the important thing to note here is this interval from 2622 to 35 is the interval that was well tested. So we actually do have test information across this interval. So at the moment, that's my log poro perm relationship. That's a poro perm relationship, just a straight line. Okay, and that's at a one centimeter scale. So I'm going to upscale that now. Well, hang on, wrong way. I'm going to upscale that now. And first thing you know, that's just going to a core plug scale. So from one centimeter to four centimeters. Look what happens to the porosity to permeability relationship. So already it's gone. This is an important point to note. Point to note. We don't go, the permeability doesn't decrease. It doesn't go down. It goes up. It's an upscaling. Is, so it pushes a whole lot of stuff up at this end. That's just going to the core plug scale. And we go to the log scale. It's going a little bit up again. And the reason this happens, let's just go back to here for a second. Sorry, I'm just jumping around a bit. So why does this happen? Well, it's pretty straightforward. If I look at, if I look at this relationship here, what's actually happening is we've, we've done that averaging with a different beds. But if I start from a different place, so the bottom end of these points is a different place on this curve, then we get a whole family of these type of curves going up. So that's what we get in real data. It's a whole family of curves going up. So we expect to see these kind of things. So what we see in our upscaling operation here is exactly what you would expect if you think about it. The problem is we haven't been thinking about it. So there's a four, that's, that's your up to four centimeter scale, up to a log scale. And obviously, we're using, losing vertical resolution, which is why we have less points in these. So, so if you're going to draw a straight line, draw a line through here, it would no longer be straight. Your best fitness model is no longer through this, through, it's longer straight through here. And you can start to see we're losing a bit, a little bit of vertical resolution, but not so bad. Maybe the water saturation is being lost a bit here. And I'll give you some numbers on that in a second. But when I go to a static model scale, 
if we don't man model these things properly, we're going to lose, we're losing a lot of, lot of the performance behavior. So, I mean, look at this water saturation averages. So there's a whole lot of things going, going off, here, off here. We have to be really careful. So poor OPM we might get right, but the water saturation actually has an impact, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Dynamic model scale, then there's just a whole lot of stuff going wrong. But you see, the, uh, what I want you to notice is the poor OPM model has changed. So we go from core photograph scale to a core plug scale to a log scale to a static model scale. So you can't use the same poor OPM model for different scales. That's the first thing. But that's a really important point to go on and get across. But there's some interesting things going on here. You think, well, so what, what, are we, what can we do? What is, what is this telling us? Well, this diagram is trying to show you something a little bit more complicated. What I'm showing here is core plugs in light blue on the right. Overlaid is the log-derived, um, log-scale upscale. So I'm taking, let's start again. I'm starting with the really high-scale data. I'm upscaling it to the core plug scale to give the light blue. Then I'm upscaling that light blue to the orange data, which is the wireline log scale data. Then overlaid on that in green is the core plug data. So that's the porosity and permeability from the core plugs. And what's really interesting about this is, first of all, that orange and the green, the green plug core plug data appears to overlie the log scale data pretty well. Apart from this point at the bottom, which you may have noticed is below 0.01 millidarcy, which we can tell from what Colin said before is in fact a load of rubbish. Those measurements are unreliable. So we can discount that stuff. But what's interesting is this actually confirms that we can use our core plug data and assume it's valid for the wireline log scale. Okay, So this is actually showing that we can do that. Um, the bottom is I make this assumption to assumption that we can do that is valid in this case. I'm not saying it's always valid, but it is valid in this case. I haven't run enough examples of this to see if it's valid everywhere. We are... In our business, we assume that it is, but it's probably something we should check occasionally. Okay. Again, so probably from the proceeding, it's clear that we shouldn't populate static or dynamic models with PIMs based on porosities in those models and the log scale porosity permeability transform. And the reason I mention that is because I'm still seeing people do that. Okay? Don't do it. It's going to get, underestimate your reservoir performance, which is one of the things you really don't want to do. Uh, they should upscale them, together, up, up, upscale them together. And say so which upscaling process you depends on your geology and fluids. But most cases, especially even a heterogeneous reservoir, most cases are we're assuming we're getting lateral flow because the KV goes to zero in these things. Vertical permeability goes to zero. So what can we do? Well, we can test this against some, core, some flow tests. So we had an interval, 2620, 2635, was flow tested, giving a KH around 1588 millidarcy meters. Now, I want to compare that performance with what I've estimated from my upscaling of the logs, so the high-resolution data upscaling it properly. But you've got to remember that those, the K I'm getting from my logs is a single-phase permeability, and I flowed oil in the presence of water, is a, so the well test is a two-phase permeability, which means if I'm going to compare them, I have to transform my upscaled core data, upscaled log, we'll call it core data, upscaled high resolution data, I have to transform that to, two, to a second two-phase data. And I've shown that down in here, and there's a table with it all, but essentially it summarizes. After fluid correction, so that's um, correcting for two phases, KH from the high resolution data is 1,843 meters, which is more than we got on the well test, while your conventional or poor OPM model, so that's one you would have got from a log scale data, if you just did your normal log scale data, is 1,064, which is underestimating. Uh, now, remember, we're just doing simple linear averaging. So if you had a harmonic or geometric mapping, averaging, it would be worse. Okay? So what we're seeing here is that if we don't do this, we're going to underestimate our dynamic performance. And the reason this, I said, the high res of data overestimates the KH, and there's a real reason, it's a good simple reason for that, and that's because, if I go back to the core photograph, that's because the beds in this aren't linear. They're not straight, thin-bedded systems. If it was a thin-bedded system, then the chances are the perm, as we've described it in the well test, would be much closer together. So what we've got here is a system where the oil has to flow. It can't flow in a straight line horizontally. It's actually got to do a few wiggles on its way. So we've got somewhere between the conventional and the high-resolution approach, and that's the 1588 we saw in the well test. So... <clears throat> 
In reality, in reality, assumption of horizontal flow used in the upscaling and high-resolution data is only partially valid in these kind of rocks. So if a thin-bedded system, it might be much more valid. But, and this, this approach would work there too, by the way. Okay, now this is a bit I haven't sort of touched upon a little bit before, but water saturation is also, the, and also impacted on this because your saturation height functions, unless you're really lucky, are permeability dependent. And permeability, again, is scale dependent. So in this particular case, I did keep track of the numbers um, So when you do the upscaling. And it's a very interesting bit about this. The saturation height function will generally overestimate oil saturations. And if we're using a log scale data as your baseline, it's a 14% overestimation unless you correct your saturation height function. Okay? Um, Alan Johnson put a paper in the SBWA last year in London talking about all this stuff, and he, had, he made a suggestion there about... And Alan lives in Aberdeen. Uh, Colin knows him well. Um, and I had a good discussion with Alan about this at the time. Um, Yes, Alan suggested we use, he wants people to use a second permeability in your model that you can use there to uh, describe the saturation height function, which is different from the dynamic behavior. Now, I'm just a simple, simple petrophysicist. That seems to me an overly complicated way of doing it and confusing way to do it, because people will go, well, which permeability do I use for what? So it turns out it's much easier just to put a scalar into your saturation height function to match the log. So the way you do that is you upscale your, your poro perm data, then you run your saturation height function, and then you tweak the saturation height function so it matches the correct volumes where you need them. So you do actually have to test it, and you have to test it in some, some example, what's the best way, some representative wells from your field. So you really do have to test it and, and check it. And it's interesting because when Alan pointed this out, it rang a bell in my head, and I went back through my files. And that's the other advantage of being a consultant, by the way, is that your files go back a very long time because you don't lose them every time you change company. And I found some, 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 I'd actually looked at this, exactly this problem back in 2002, and I'd got sidetracked off it, but uh, you know, I'd, I'd noticed exactly the same thing. So this is, this is a valid concern, and I've checked a bit, we've done some work on this. So check your saturation height functions. Okay, so here's the summary on the water saturation. No impact on homogeneous reservoirs. You don't have to worry about it. It only has an impact when you've got heterogeneous formations, and it turns out it only really has an impact if your permeability is less than about 50 millidarcies. So if you've got a good reservoir, most of the reservoir are about 50 millidarcies, you probably don't have to worry about this issue. But if you have beds in your reservoir that have got hydrocarbons in them that are less than 50 millidarcies, you should check. Okay? And you should also check if you're getting, the more you, closer you get to the transition zone, the more it becomes an issue. Uh, depends on the thickness of your beds. It's just one of those things you need to run through the exercise and see. So what else have we got? Um, yeah, so the, at the bottom, the important point is you need to carry out some upscaling trials. Don't trust that the assumptions that you've been making are always valid. Because we found in this case that mm, some of them are, some of them aren't. So the, the fact that the porosity and the permeability uh, from the core plugs are, are valid for the log scale. Um, the reason that's worked is, <laughs> yeah, it's, this is one of those nasty, nasty things you don't want to say, but I'm going to have to say anyway. The reason that actually worked is because what, what, what actually happens, one of the problems we have when I mean, people take core plugs is in that we want, as a petrophysicist, I want those core plugs to be regularly sampled. So I'd like them every 30 centimetres. So that means they're really easy to run a filter over and compare with the wireline logs. But what happens in the lab is the lab technician goes along and he'll go to that 30 centimetre point and he'll go, well, that's a nice homogeneous bit of rock. I'll take the plug here. And then he goes to the next one and he goes... Ooh, if I take a plug here, I'm not going to be able to get a measurement. The plug's going to fail. So I shift it a bit to make it a more homogeneous measurement. So, and he does that as he goes through the core. And if you've seen that photograph of the core here, he's doing that a lot. But what that actually means is I'm getting biased sampling. Okay? So ideally, we don't want to see that. But in our case, it's worked because it's actually made... What it's done is it's given us a baseline to get a poroperm model that puts mostly homogeneous plugs. So when we do the upscaling, we can actually see what goes on. But you have to be aware that that's what's happening in order for this, for this to be useful. If that makes... I'm not sure if I got that clearly through or not, but we'll see when you ask questions. So what are we going to say to the end? We've got modelled and real data, and we've used them to illustrate some of the difficulties in upscaling heterogeneous reservoirs. And I want to make this point. This is one case which we've got lots of data for, it's by no means the only case where I've seen this as a problem or an issue. In fact, 
I would say probably this is an issue in most reservoirs. Yeah, if you've got a really big, thick reservoirs and up in the north of the shelf, the big, thick stuff, probably not going to worry about it. But you've got the thinner stuff, yeah, you probably do need to worry about it. Um, the other point, all the measurements we, have, we, we can acquire have a vertical resolution that differs from the measurement type. Um, so what we really want isn't what we can't measure what we really want is, the, is, is what I'm trying to say there. And that vertical resolution does impact on the relationship between the volumetric property, so that's porosity and water saturation, and permeability. So the vertical scale you're working at has an impact on those issues, on those, on those relationships. So that's porosity to permeability and saturation height. So only in homogeneous reservoirs can you assume that those relationships between porosity and permeability or saturation do not change with vertical scale. Only in homogeneous reservoirs. Otherwise, they do. So I'd recommend you always investigate the impact of that upscaling on the relationships you are using. They're not hard to do. The, the hardest part of, that, of this exercise we've been through here isn't the upscaling exercise. It's actually just getting the data. So that's the hardest part. So just think about scale. And I'm going to leave you at the end with this wonderful photograph of a core that you set on a set of logs. That doesn't look anywhere near as bad as that. But it is. That's the real world. So with that... Um, We'll take some questions. There must be questions. Yeah. Well, I'll just sit close to Colin. You might use this. So just hold it, and then I will. Steve, thanks for that interesting talk. Those who don't know me, I'm Trevor McGee. Um, Steve and I go back at least 25 years. I think it's 27 when I recalculated. But uh, <laughs> Steve, you mentioned uh, the regular sampling and you know going for every 30 centimeters if possible. If that isn't possible, do you think there's a case to recommend sampling every facies? What I'm yeah well, probably one we can both answer, but the answer would be. Yeah, yeah, so I, I would recommend, what I'm after is a, set of as a representative set of core. If I'm not sampling regularly, it means I, it makes it harder for me to compare, with my, compare to upscale my core data to the logs, but I'd rather have a, all the porosities and permeabilities and fasces sampled than not have them all there. I, do you want anything, anything to that? Yeah, I mean, you know, sampling's a real issue. One of the things we didn't mention on this is... Um, in one of the wells, we used a scratch tester, which is a continuous strength measurement, but strength is inversely related to porosity and to permeability. And that was very revealing when we actually sampled on the basis of that. So we looked back and looked at the heterogeneity and classified the strength heterogeneity. In fact, we chose a lot of our scale samples from that. And quite successfully, whereas in other wells, sometimes the, uh, you're right, uh, you, you've got some, you know, the, the, the spacing isn't random, but it's you know, it is biased generally. I guess adding, adding to that, I'd like to say is that if you've got you, the high resolution data I showed, which came from the core, if you've got that kind of approach and you've got the core plugs and you can upscale the two together, it doesn't really matter where they're taken from. That will tell you whether you've got the fasces correct. So, yeah, I'd rather have all the fasces than, than regular sampling. Ideally, you want both, but if there's a choice, that's what I'd make. Uh, thank you, Steve, for the interesting presentation. I have two questions, basically. The, the first question about like the term heterogeneity, as you mentioned, because heterogeneity is like a qualitative measurement. Did you like uh, think about a way to quantify heterogeneity, like how heterogeneous or how homogeneous? And then we can put a cutoff that, okay, this reservoir is homogeneous or this reservoir is heterogeneous, and then apply the relevant corrections and so on. This is the first question. And the second question is about, like, the differentiation between anisotropy and heterogeneity, because there are two different things, and we know that permeability, for example, can be anisotropic rather than heterogeneous in the reservoir. And, okay, as you mentioned always uh, in your presentation, that it should be taken into account like sometimes separately. So there are two questions if you can answer. 
Thank you very much. Okay, well, let's... Um, can you remind me of the first question first? Well, please. Yeah. The first question uh, was about quantifying oh. the heterogeneity. Okay, yeah, yeah. right. Let's so quantifying heterogeneity. What I would say... It, I mean, it's easy to say just quantify it everywhere, but that's not really going to help you. So what I, my view on this is, is basically you look at the log scale data. If it's varying at around the log scale or less, then I would term it heterogeneous. Okay? So if it's... So if it's for 15 centimetres, or let's call it 30 centimetres, so two, two increments, it's varying below that scale, then you're going to effectively be heterogeneous. If it's varying at a scale that's greater than that, you probably don't need to worry about it too much. But, you know, having said that, it's, it's something I think you should check. Okay, so that's, that's the first thing. Um, you agree with that? Yeah. Yep. And the second question was on... Anisotropy. right. Permeability, you're absolutely right. Permeability is one of those things that we make a lot of assumptions about. And what we're going to do, what we, the assumption we're making when we do this exercise is that, first of all, that the KV is, is, is not very large. And generally, for these type of reservoirs, it's not. So if I was to upscale any of these beds that you see on that screen up there, uh, over about two centimetres, the KV goes to zero. So, so that's essentially gone. So we're now we're talking about the two horizontal permeabilities. So what we effectively need to know is if we knew the direction that the things were deposited and we could actually back out a, the two very horizontal permeabilities, maybe we could do something on those lines. But as it turns out, we don't usually measure that. So we're making, in this exercise as we run here, we've made an assumption that the KHs are all the same, which, yeah, it's, it's probably, yeah, whether it's a valid assumption or not, I suspect it's probably not. Um, but in some systems it would be. Um, but what we effect, or hopefully what we're doing is, because we do see a reasonable relationship between porosity and permeability on the more homogeneous plugs. So we're assuming we're seeing the maximum, maximum horizontal permeability is what I hope we're getting, rather than the minimum. And if we do that, then we're probably not going too far off as far as performance goes. Inshallah. <laughs> yeah, uh, my name is Musa from CoLab, and uh, just wait. Yeah, and uh, I just want to make a point about sidewall cores. If you just went for sidewall cores and no core, how would you uh, determine your heterogeneity? Um, <laughs> what can I say? Um, I'm afraid the industry is moving to sidewall core and digital core analysis because um, it's eventually cheaper. We've not been able to do this with the sidewall core. Not at all. In fact, a lot of the sidewall cores failed, didn't they? Yes, they did. Yeah, so we would have even less data. And there's nothing beats a full diameter core. And the question about anisotropy, of course, if you do whole core analysis, you can also get an idea of the, the anisotropy in the horizontal direction. This wasn't particularly necessary here, but in part of the carbonates, when we're doing a lot of work in the Middle East, um, that becomes very important, whole core analysis, which you can't do with um, sidewall core. You have to make sure that core is orientated if you're going to do the whole, whole core analysis, of course. Uh, one more, Steve, and I hope I don't dig myself into a hole here trying to explain this. But I think we had an example where uh, the operator had been de describing the reservoir exactly as you had said and um, effectively overestimating water saturation. And when we looked and we went to the, uh, the core, we, we found this was a laminated section. So our approach was actually to look at a plug, and let's say the plug was, for instance, 50% shale, 50% sand. Then we said, well, the shale porosity is zero, the shale um, permeability is zero. Assumption, but probably not too bad. And then effectively doubled the sandstone porosity and, and applied a net to gross to the, to the reservoir. And we found we got something that we, we felt we got a better history match with. Uh, is, is that approach you would uh, recommend? I understand where you're coming from with this. It's, um, it, and you're absolutely right in that there's, there's no, no oil found in the shale, shale elements. Um, usually, it, if you're using, um, it depends on what sort of how you're doing the work, but it's generally the, the rule of thumb of doing a of, of doubling is probably not a rule of thumb. There is some change. So you certainly can work out what the correction should be. And that's essentially what you do in a thin bed type approach. So, yeah, it's, 
that there's nothing wrong with that approach per se, but you just have to remember to discount the volumes by the shale you've, you've removed. Um, the only point I would make about that, though, is you've got to be aware that, as we commented before, is that core plugs are selected to be homogeneous. So when they go through to drilling the core plugs, they are already being selected. There's a, a selection process. So you, you may be, if you just use the core plugs alone, you're going to over, overestimate what's actually happening. You need to actually look at the whole core to see what's really going on. Thank you. Thank you. I'm a drilling guy, so I look at some of these things a little differently. I was wondering if um, we drilled the well vertically and completed it and uh, selectively perforated it uh, uh, based on the mud log and ROP and gas, and then we have a field there. So then we do three multilaterals from that vertical and say out of a thousand meters in th three directions, and then s again s selectively perforated it and sand or acid fracked uh, the sand to say get a th 200 meter diameter on your permeability to the perforation that you selectively perforated, and then and then multi complete it, leaving the vertical separate, uh, and then having your three commingled multilaterals. Would you be able to calculate how you get a greater, 40% greater return on asset with that method versus what we conventionally use? I don't think this is really the right forum for that question. All I can tell you at the moment is if that approach wouldn't have worked on this, this particular reservoir, because it's not laid out that way, it's not, it hasn't been deposited in that system. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, I can't know, that's, What's the economics? The economics change the numbers. So yeah, we're not really in a position to answer that question. So it's really beyond the, beyond the scope of our um, expertise in this particular field. Any other questions? Yeah, I'll go, Steve. Um, yeah, uh, Chris Woods, for those that don't know me. Um, thanks for a great presentation, guys. Um, I was just interested in um, going from the one centimetre scale, which seems to be a linear, and then you show the actual core plug data, and it's quite high, and it looks similar to the stuff that it ends up being when you upscale. So can you maybe talk us through why you start off with a linear thing which doesn't really represent the core plug data, and then what, how different really is um, the actual poor perm cloud that we normally use to that sort of general one metre scale? I knew somebody had spotted the question. I should have known it was you. <laughs> That you could spend all day describing. I could spend all day describing how we got that, but essentially, what it comes down to is that Poirier model we started with the high resolution data is based on the cleanest core plugs that we got. So just taking those on, those alone and leaving the ones that are with the, that had any any signs at all of shale are out. So it's just the really clean stuff that we were sure and the, and the measurements we were sure of. So that's essentially where that comes from. Yeah, it's a, it's a it's a simplified model. Yeah. No, it's, it's, um, so what's actually happened is, that the, yeah, this is a, maybe we should take this one offline because it could go on for a while, but essentially we've, we've calibrated the, that back to the back to the original core, so we've got the high resolution data, we've calibrated specific points that we've up, upscaled to that core plug data and bring it back to, so that the endpoints are tied, it's the bit in the middle that's not tied. So yeah, there's a, there's a whole lot we can go on about, but I'll, maybe we talk about this one off, offline. Yeah. Any more questions? One last question. Looks like no more questions. So uh, we have uh, two presents, two tokens, some medals, coins from WEA with a symbol of FESOS and SPWLA. I think they are gold uh, coded but it's not enough to retire on them either. <laughs> so um, thank you for uh, doing this presentation for free, I would say, and uh, thank you. Thanks. Okay, thank you.